receptionist was an elegant African-American woman wearing a dark, expensive business suit. A well-dressed exception to the usual crowd of the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee, SPDC, in Atlanta, where I had returned after graduation to work full-time. On her first day, I had rambled over to her in my regular uniform of jeans and sneakers and offered to answer any questions she might have to help her get acclimated. She looked at me coolly and waved me away after reminding me that she was, in fact, an experienced legal secretary. The next morning, when I arrived at work in another jeans and sneakers ensemble, she seemed startled, as if some strange vagrant had made a wrong turn into the office. She took a beat to compose herself, then summoned me over to confide that she was leaving in a week to work at a real law office. I wished her luck. An hour later, she called my office to tell me that Robert E. Lee was on the phone. I smiled, pleased that I had misjudged her. She clearly had a sense of humor. That's really funny. I'm not joking. That's what he said, she said, sounding bored, not playful. Line two. I picked up the line. Hello, this is Brian Stevenson. May I help you? Brian, this is Robert E. Lee Key. Why in the hell would you want to resent someone like Walter McMillan? Do you know he's reputed to be one of the biggest drug dealers in all of South Alabama? I got your notice entering an appearance, but you won't. You don't want anything to do with this case. Sir, this is Judge Key, and you don't want to have anything to do with, with this McMillan case. No one really understands how depraved the situation truly is, including me. But I know it's ugly. These men might not even be Dixon Mafia. The lecture tone and bewildering phrase from a judge I'd never met left me completely confused. Dixie Mafia? I'd met Walter McMillan two weeks earlier, after spending a day on death row to begin work on five capital cases. I hadn't reviewed the trial transcript yet, but I did remember that the judge's last name was Key. No one had told me the Robert E. Lee part. I struggled for an image of Dixie Mafia that would fit, fit Walter McMillan. Dixie Mafia? Yes, and there's no telling what else. Now, son, I'm not going to appoint some out-of-state lawyer who's not a member of the Alabama bar to take on one of these death penalty cases. So you just go ahead and withdraw. I'm a member of the Alabama bar. I'd lived in Atlanta, Georgia, but I had been admitted to the Alabama bar a year earlier after working on some cases in Alabama concerning jail and prison conditions. Well, I'm not sitting in Mobile. I'm not up in Monroeville anymore. If we have a hearing in your motion, you're going to have to come all the way from Alabama to Mobile. I'm not going to accommodate you, no kind of way. I understand, sir. I can come to Mobile if necessary. Well, I'm also not going to appoint you because I don't think he's indignant. He's reported to have money buried all over Monroe County. Judge, I'm not seeking appointment. I've told Mr. McMillan that we would. The dial tone interrupted by my first affirmative statement of the phone call. I spent several minutes thinking we'd been accidentally disconnected before finally realizing that a judge had just hung up on me. I was in my late 20s about to start my fourth year at the SPDC when I met Walter McMillan. His case was one of the flood of cases I'd found myself frantically working on after learning of a growing crisis in Alabama. The state had nearly 100 people on death row as well as the fastest growing condemned population of the country. But it also had no public defender system, which meant that large numbers of death row prisoners had no legal representation of any kind. My friend, Eva Ansley, ran ran an Alabama prison project, which tracked cases and matched lawyers with condemned men. In 1988, we discovered an opportunity to get federal funding to create a legal center that could represent people on death row. The plan was to use the funding to start a new nonprofit. We hope to open it in Tuscaloosa and begin working on cases in that in the next year. I'd already worked on lots of death penalty cases in several southern states, sometimes winning a stay of execution just minutes before an electrocution was scheduled. But I didn't think I was ready to take on the responsibilities of running a nonprofit law office. I planned to help get the organization off the ground, find a director, and then return to Atlanta. When I'd visited death row a few weeks before that call from Robert E. Lee Key, I met with five desperate condemned men. Willie Tabb, Vernon Madison, Jesse Morrison, Harry Nix, and Walter McMillan. It was an exhausting, emotionally taxing day, and the cases and clients had merged together in my mind on the long drive back to Atlanta. But I remember Walter. He was at least 15 years older than me, not particularly well-educated, and he hailed from a small rural community. 
The memorable thing about him was how insistent he was that he'd been wrongly convicted. Mr. Bryan, I know it may not matter to you, but it's important to me that you know that I'm innocent and didn't do what they said I did, not in no kind of way, he told me in the meeting room. His voice was level but laced with emotion. I nodded to him. I'd learned to accept what clients tell me until the facts suggest something else. Sure, of course I understand. When I review the record, I'll have a better sense of the evidence they have, and we can talk about it. But look, I'm sure I'm not the first person on death row to tell you that they're innocent, but I really need you to believe me. My life has been ruined. This lie they put on me is more than I can bear, and if I don't get help from someone who believes me... His lip began to quiver, and he clenched his fist to stop himself from crying. I sat quietly while he forced himself back into composure. I'm sorry. I know you'll do everything you can to help me, he said, his voice quieter. My instinct was to confront him. His pain seemed so sincere. But there wasn't much I could do, and after several hours on the road talking to so many people, I could muster only enough energy to reassure him that I would look at everything carefully. I had several transcripts piled up on a small Atlanta office, ready to move to Tuscaloosa once the office opened. With Judge Robert E. Lee Key's peculiar comments still running through my head, I went through the mound of records until I found the transcripts from Walter McMillan's trial. There were only four volumes of trial proceedings, which meant that the trial had been short. The judge's dramatic warnings now made Mr. McMillan's emotional claim of innocence too intriguing to put off any longer. I started reading. Even though he lived in Monroe County his whole life, Walter McMillan had never heard of Harper Lee or To Kill a Mockingbird. Did y'all read that book in middle school or high school, To Kill a Mockingbird? Monroeville, Alabama celebrated its native daughter Lee shamelessly after her award-winning book became a national bestseller in 1960s. She returned to Monroe County but secluded herself and was rarely seen in public. Her reclusiveness proved no barrier to the county's continued efforts to market her literary classic or to market itself by using the book Celebrity. Production of the film adaptation brought Gregory Peck to town for the infamous courtroom scenes. His performance won him an Academy Award. Local leaders later turned the old courthouse into a mockingbird museum. A group of locals formed the Mockingbird Players of Monroeville to present a stage version of the story. The production was so popular that national and international tours were organized to provide an authentic representation of the fictional story to audiences everywhere. Sentimentally, sentimentality about Lee's story grew even as the harder grew even as the harder truths of the book took no root. The story of an innocent black man bravely defended by a white lawyer in the 1930s fascinated millions of readers, despite its uncomfortable exploration of false accusations of rape involving a white woman. Lee's enduring characters Atticus Finch and his precocious daughter Scout captivated readers while confronting them with some of the realities of race and justice in the South. A generation of future lawyers grew up hoping to become a become the courageous Atticus, who at one point arms himself to protect the defenseless black suspect from an angry mob of white men looking to lynch him. Remember, we spoke about lynching and the terror last year, last week. Today, dozens of legal organizations hand out awards in the fictional lawyer's name to celebrate the model of advocacy described in Lee's novel. What is often overlooked is that the black man falsely accused in the story was not successfully defended by Atticus. Tom Robinson, the wrongly accused black defendant, is found guilty. Later he dies full of despair. Later he dies when full of despair, he makes a desperate attempt to escape from prison. He is shot 17 times in the back by his captors, dying ingloriously but not unlawfully. Walter McMillan, like Tom Robinson, grew up in one of the several poor black settlements outside of Monroeville, where he worked the fields with his family before he was old enough to attend school. So right now what Brian Stevenson is doing is he's connecting this story, this fictional story of a falsely accused black man and to kill a mockingbird to Walter McMillan, who is the man that he is defending and writing this story about, writing Just Mercy about. The children of sharecroppers in southern Alabama were introduced to plow and planting and picking as soon as they were old enough to be useful in the fields. Educational opportunities for black children in the 1950s were limited, but Walter's mother got him to the dilapidated colored school for a couple of years when he was young. Dilapidated means broken down, not well put together. 
By the time Walter was eight or nine, he began too valuable for picking cotton to justify the remote advantages of going to school. By the age of 11, Walter could run a plow as well as any of his older siblings. Okay, so he was taken out of school, and now he just works on the cotton field from 11. So he has no schooling after 11. Times were changing, for better or for worse. Monroe County had been developed by plantation owners in the 19th century for the production of cotton. Situated in the coastal plain of southwest Alabama, the fertile, rich black soil of the area attracted white settlers from the Carolinas who amassed very successful plantations and a huge slave population. For the decades after the Civil War, the large African-American population toiled in the fields for the Black Belt as sharecroppers and tenant farmers dependent on white landowners for survival. In the 1940s, thousands of African Americans left the region as part of the Great Migration and headed mostly to the Midwest and the West Coast for jobs. Those who remained continued to work the land, but the out-migration of African Americans combined with the other factors to make traditional agriculture less sustainable as the economic base of the region. By the 1950s, small cotton farming was becoming increasingly less profitable, even the low-wage labor provided by black sharecroppers and tenants. The state of Alabama agreed to help white landowners in the region transition to timber farming and forest products by providing extraordinary tax incentives for pulp and paper mills. 13 of the state's 16 pulp and paper mills were opened during this period. Across the Black Belt, more and more acres were converted to growing pine trees for paper mills and industrial uses. African Americans, largely excluded from this new industry, found themselves confronting new economic challenges even if they won basic civil rights. The brutal era of sharecroppers and Jim Crow was ending, but what followed was persistent unemployment and worsening poverty. The region's counties remained some of the poorest in America. Walter was smart enough to see this trend. He started his own pulpwood business and evolved with the timber industry in the 1970s. He astutely and bravely borrowed money to buy his new, his own power saw, tractor, and pulpwood truck. By the 1980s, he had developed a solid business that didn't generate a lot of extra money, but afforded him a gratifying degree of independence. If he had worked at the mill or the factory or had some other unskilled job, the kind that most poor black people in South Alabama worked, it would invariably mean working for white business owners and dealing with all the racial stress that they implied in Alabama in the 1970s and 1980s. Walter couldn't escape the reality of racism, but having his own business in a grocery sector of the economy gave him a latitude that many African Americans did not enjoy. The independence won Walter some measure of respect and admiration, but it also cultivated contempt and suspicion, especially outside of Monroeville's black community. Walter's freedom was, for some of the white people in town, well beyond what African Americans with limited education were able to achieve through legitimate means. Still, he was pleasant, respectful, generous, and accommodating, which made him well-liked by the people with whom he did business, whether black or white. This paragraph kind of talks about the zero-sum theory, saying that Walter McMillan's success is almost too good to be true. It kind of, they're thinking that it needs, that shows that they're losing if this black man is succeeding, the zero-sum theory. Walter was not without his flaws. He had long been known as a ladies' man. Even though he had married young and had three children with his wife, Minnie, it was well known that he was romantically involved with other women. Tree work is notoriously demanding and dangerous. With few ordinary comforts in his life, the attention of women was something Walter did not easily resist. There is something about his rough exterior, his bushy long hair and uneven beard, combined with his generous and charming nature that attracted the attention of some women. Walter grew up understanding how forbidden it was for a black man to be intimate with a white woman. But by the 1980s, he had allowed himself to imagine that such matters might be changing. Perhaps if he hadn't been successful enough to live off his own business, he would have more consistently kept in mind those racial lines that could never be crossed. As it was, Walter didn't initially think much of the flirt flirtations of Carrie Kelly, a young white woman he met at the Waffle House where he ate breakfast. She was attractive, but he didn't take her too seriously. When her flirtations became more explicit, Walter hesitated and then persuaded himself that no one would ever know. After a few weeks, it became clear that his relationship with Karen was trouble. 
At 25, Karen was 18 years younger than Walter, and she was married. As word got around that the two were friends, she seemed take, to take a titillating pride in her intimacy with Walter. When her husband found out, things quickly turned ugly. Karen and her husband Joe had long been unhappy and were already planning to divorce, but her scandalous involvement with a black man outraged Karen's husband and his entire family. He initiated legal proceedings to gain custody of their children and became intent on publicly disgracing his wife by exposing her infidelity and revealing her relationship with a black man. For his part, Walter had always stayed clear of the courts and far away from the law. Years earlier, he had been drawn into a bar fight that resulted in a misdemeanor conviction and a night in jail. It was the first and only time he had been in trouble. From that point on, he had no exposure on the criminal justice system. When Walter received a subpoena from Karen Kelly's husband to testify at a hearing where the Kellys would be fighting over their children's custody, he knew it was going to cause him serious problems. Unable to consult with his wife, Minnie, who had a better head for these kind of crises, he nervously went to the courthouse. The lawyer for Kelly's husband called Walter to the stand. Walter had decided to acknowledge being a friend of Karen. Her lawyer objected to the crude questions posed by, to Walter by the husband's attorney about the nature of his friendship, sparing him from providing any details. But when he left the courtroom, the anger and animosity toward him were palpable. Walter wanting to forget about the whole ordeal, but word spread quickly and his reputation shifted. No longer the hardworking pulp, pulpwood man known to white people almost exclusively for what he could do with a saw and pine trees, Walter now represented something more worrisome. Fears of interracial sex and marriage have deep roots in the United States. The confluence of race and sex was a powerful force in dismantling Reconstruction after the Civil War, sustaining Jim Crow laws for a century, and fueling divisive racial politics through the 20th century. In the aftermath of slavery, the creation of a system of racial hierarchy and segregation was largely designed to prevent intimate relations like Walter and Karen's. Relationships that were in fact legally prohibited by anti miscegenation whoa, mis... misen miscegenation statutes. The word miscegenation comes into use in the 1860s when supporters of slavery's co slavery coined the term to promote the fear of interracial sex and marriage and the race mixing that would result if slavery, slavery was abolished. For over a century, law enforcement officials in many Southern communities absolutely saw it as part of their duty to investigate and punish black men who had been intimate with white women. Although the federal government had promised racial equality for freed former slaves during the short period of Reconstruction, the return of white supremacy and racial subordination came quickly after federal troops left Alabama in the 1870s. Voting rights were taken away from African Americans, and a series of racially restrictive laws enforced the racial hierarchy. Racial integrity laws Racial integrity laws were part of a plan to replicate slavery's racial hierarchy and reestablish the subordination of African Americans. Having criminalized interracial sex and marriages, states through the South would use the laws to justify the forced sterilization of poor and minority women. Forbidding sex between white women and black men became an intense preoccupation through the South. In the 1800s, a few years before lynching became the standard response to interracial romance, Jesus Christ, and a century before Walter and Karen Kelly began their affair, Tony Pace, an African-American man, and Mary Cox, a white woman, fell in love in Alabama. They were arrested and convicted, and both were sentenced to two years in prison for violating Alabama's racial integrity laws. John Tompkins, a lawyer and part of a small minority of the white professionals who considered the racial integrity laws to be unconstitutional, agreed to represent Tony and Mary to appeal their convictions. The Alabama Supreme Court reviewed the case in 1882. With rhetoric that would be quoted frequently over the next several decades, Alabama's highest court affirmed the convictions using language that dripped with contempt for the idea of interracial romance. The U.S. Supreme Court Court reviewed the Alabama's court decision using separate but equal language that previewed the court's infamous decision in Plessy v. Ferguson 20 years later. The court unanimously upheld Alabama's restrictions on interracial sex and marriage decision. Whoa. 
interracial sex and marriage and affirmed the prison prison terms imposed on Tony Pace and Mary Cox. Following the court's decision, more states passed racial integrity laws and made it illegal for African Americans and sometimes Native Americans and Asian Americans to marry or have sex with whites. While the restrictions were aggressively enforced in the South, they are also common in the Midwest and, and West. The state of Idaho banned interracial marriage and sex between white and black people in 1921, even though the state's population was 99.8% not black. It wasn't until 1967 that the United States Supreme Court finally struck down anti miscegenation statutes in Loving versus Virginia, but restrictions on interracial marriage persisted even after that landmark ru- ruling. Alabama state const- constitution still prohibited the practice in 1986 when Walter met Karen Kelly. Section 102 of the state constitution read, The legislator shall never pass any law to authorize or legalize any marriage between any white person. I don't want to say that word, actually. Or black person. No one expected a relatively successful and independent man like Walter to follow every rule. Occasionally drinking too much, getting into a fight, or even having an extramarital affair. That means, uh having sex or being intimate with someone outside of your marriage, extramarital. These weren't indiscretions significant enough to destroy the reputation and standing of an honest and industrious black man who could be trusted to do good work. But interracial dating, particularly with a married white woman, was for many whites an unconscionable act. Unconscionable. In the South, crimes like murder or assault might send you to prison, but interracial sex was a transgression in its own unique category of danger with correspondingly extreme punishments. Hundreds of black men have been lynched for even unsubstantiated suggestions of such intimacy. Walter didn't know the legal history, but like every black man in Alabama, he knew deep, deep in his bones the perils of interracial romance. Nearly a dozen people had been lynched in Marone County alone since its incorporation. Dozens of additional lynching had taken place in neighboring counties, and the true power of those lynchings far exceed their number. There were acts of terror more than anything else, inspiring fear that in any encounter with a white person, any interracial social misstep, any unintended slight, any ill-advised look or comment could trigger a gruesome and lethal response. Walter heard his parents and relatives talk about lynchings when he was a young child. When he was 12, the body of Russell Charlie, a black man from Monroe County, was found hanging from a tree in Verdenburg, Alabama. The lynching of Charlie, who is known by Walter's family, was believed to have prompted by an interracial romance. Walter remembered well the terror that shot through the black community in Monroe County when Charlie's lifeless, bullet-ridden body was found swinging in a tree. And now it seemed to Walter that everyone in Monroe County was talking about his own relationship with Karen Kelly. It worried him in a way that few things ever had. A few weeks later, an even more unthinkable act shocked Monroeville. In the late morning of November 1, 1986, Rhonda Morrison, the beautiful young daughter of a respected local family, was found dead on the floor of Monroe Cleaners, the shop where the 18-year-old college student had worked. She had been shot in the back three times. Murder was uncommon in Monroeville, and an apparent robbery... Robbery murder in a popular downtown business was unprecedented. The death of a young Rhonda was a crime unlike anything the community had ever experienced. She was popular, an only child, and by all accounts without blemish. She was the kind of girl whom the entire white community embraced as a daughter. The police initially believed that no one from the community, black or white, would have done something so horrific. Two Latino men had been spotted in Monroeville looking for work the day Rhonda Morrison's body was found, and they became the first first suspects. Police tracked down in Florida and determined that the two men could not have committed the murder. The former owner of the cleaners, an older white man named Miles Jackson, fell under suspicion, but there was no evidence that pointed to him as a killer. The current owner of the cleaners, Rick Blair, was questioned, but considered an unlikely suspect. Within a few weeks, the police had tapped out their leads. People in Monroe County began to whisper about the incompetence of the police. When there were still no arrests several months later, the whispers became louder and public criticisms of the police, sheriff, and local prosecutors were aired in the local newspaper and on local radio station. 
Tom Tate was elected the new county sheriff days after the murder took place, and folks started to question whether he was up for the job. The Alabama Bureau of Investigation, ABI, was called in to investigate the murder, but achieved no more success solving the crime than local officials had. People in Monroeville became anxious. Local business posted rewards offering thousands of dollars for information leading to the arrest. Gun sales, which were always their best, increased. Meanwhile, Walter was wrestling with his own problems. He'd been trying for weeks to end his relationship with Karen Kelly. The child custody proceedings and public scandal had taken a toll on her. She had started using drugs and seemed to fall apart. She began to associate with Ralph Myers, a white man with a, ba with a badly disfigured face and lengthy criminal record who seemed to perfectly embody her fall from grace. Ralph was an unusual partner for Karen, but she was in such serious decline that nothing she did made any sense to her friends and family. The relationship brought Karen to rock bottom, beyond scandal and drug use into serious criminal behavior. Together, they became involved in dealing drugs and were implicated in the murder of Vicki Lynn Pittman, a young woman from neighboring Escambia County. Police had quick success in investigating the Pittman murder, rapidly concluding that Ralph Myers had been involved. When the police interrogated Ralph, they encountered, they encountered a man as psychologically complicated as well as he was physically scarred. He was emotional, frail, and he craved attention. His only effective defense was his skill, manipulation, and misdirection. Ralph believed that everything he said to be epic, shocking, and elaborate. As a child living in foster care, he had been horribly burned in a fire. The burn so scarred and became and disfigured his face and neck that he needed multiple surgeries, surgeries to regain basic functioning. He'd become quite used to strangers staring at his scars with pained expressions on their faces. He was a tragic outcast who lived in the margins, but he tried to compensate for pretending to have inside knowledge of all sorts of mysteries. After initially denying any direct involvement in the Pittman murder, Myers conceded that he may have played some accidental role but quickly put the blame for the murder itself on a more interesting local figure. He first accused a black man with a bad reputation named Isaac Daly, but the police quickly discovered that Daly had been in jail cell the night of the murder. Myers then confessed he had made up the story because the true killer was none other than the elected sheriff of a nearby county. As outrageous as the claim was, ABI agents appeared to take it seriously. They asked him more questions, but the more Myers talked, the less credible his story sounded. Officials began to suspect that Myers was the sole killer and was desperately trying to implicate others to minimize his culpability. While the death of Vicki Pittman was news, it failed to compare with the continuing mystery surrounding the death of Rhonda Morrison. Vicki came from a poor white family, several of those whose members were incarcerated. She enjoyed none of the status of Rhonda Morrison. The Morrison murder remained the focus of everyone's attention for months. Ralph Myers was illiterate but he knew that it was the Morrison crime that was preoccupying law enforcement investigators. When his allegations against the sheriff didn't seem to be going anywhere, he changed his story again and told investigators that he had been involved in the murder of Vicki Pittman, along with Karen Kelly and her black boyfriend, Walter McMillan. But that wasn't all. He also told police that McMillan was responsible for the murder of Rhonda Morrison. That assertion attracted the full attention of law enforcement officials. It had soon become apparent that Walter McMillan had never met Ralph Myers, let alone committed two murders with him. To prove that the two of them were in cahoots, an ABI agent asked Myers to meet Walter McMillan at a store while agents monitored the interaction. It had been several months since Rhonda Morrison's murder. Once Myers entered the store, he was not able to identify Walter McMillan among several black men present. He had to ask the owner of the store to point McMillan out. He then delivered a note to McMillan, purposely written by Karen Kelly. According to witnesses, Walter seemed confused both by Myers, a man he had never seen before, and the note itself. Walter threw the note away and went back to what he was doing. He paid little attention to the whole odd encounter. The monitoring ABI agents left with nothing to suggest any relationship between Myers and McMillan, and plenty of evidence indicating the two men had never met. Still, they persisted with the McMillan theory. Time was passing, seven months by this time, and the community was fearful and angry. Criticism was mounting. They desperately needed an arrest. 
Monroe County Sheriff Tom Tate did not have much law enforcement experience. By his own description, he was very local and took pride in never having ventured too far from Monroeville. Now four months into his term as sheriff, he faced a seemingly unsolvable murder and intense public pressure. When Myers told police about McMillan's relationship with Karen Kelly, it's likely that the infamous interracial affair was already well known to Tate as the result of the Kelly custody hearings that had generated so much gossip. But there was no evidence against McMillan, no evidence except that he was an African-American man involved in an adulterous interracial affair which meant he was reckless and possibly dangerous, even if he had no prior criminal history and a good reputation. Maybe that was evidence enough. That was the end of chapter one.